The visionary TV executive Sir Jeremy Isaacs started Channel 4 and also presided at the Royal Opera House through the period of its rebuilding. Building things is what the great and good once did. He may be the last of a breed, the barons of the arts who truly love what they were doing. Jeremy, when your mother sang in the synagogue, she could hold a note. <laughs> she sang loud and clear and held the beat one beat long, held the note one beat longer than anybody else so you knew she was there. Right. But you weren't a singer yourself. I uh, was so awful a singer, according to those who had to listen to me and to my teachers, that they, I was one of those in the class who was told to, we were called specials. And when any guy wanted the whole class to sing in tune, the music teacher wanted the whole class to sing in tune, you would say, specials keep quiet this time. And then two or three of us that couldn't sing in tune, shut up. Then you were so right. bad, you, you spread badness to others. I said, <laughs> well, I and others. But I mean, I, I my, the occasion of my bar mitzvah, I was terribly full of myself, so full of myself that I, was, I lost the place. I was glancing around the upper galleries of a synagogue, you know, to look at the girls and be sure that they were looking at me. I lost the place, and my grandfather, who was a minister, all five foot of him, was standing beside me with, his, uh, with a beautiful silver pencil pointing at the Hebrew uh, script on the, the scroll of the law, and that got me back onto it. But anyway, I accomplished this feat of singing that and then in the great chunk of the prophets that you sing along with it, after it, and I thought I'd been a triumph. I simply didn't realize that I couldn't sing a note in tune. Then I heard that somebody had heard, said, you know, terrific performance, but what a pity he can't sing in tune. <laughs> then I realized. Well, there's a lot like that with me. It's, uh, it doesn't come out, but it, I, it sure does come in. I couldn't imagine anyone being more sensitive to the sound of music than myself, except when I read you, and I can tell that you loved it from the first day, didn't you? I loved... Uh, yes, I, it'd be, my parents had music in the house, is what it came to. My mother sang. She sang Burlington Bertie from Bow in the cabaret at Glasgow University. She was a medical student, went up in 1918, when half the intake were women because of the slaughter of the First World War. And uh, they had a few records. One, I mean, but they were kind of Chabrier's Espana, Galley Kirchy singing Low Here the Gentle Lark, and... Uh, that sort of thing. And I remember they, but they were so proud of the gramophone that they would offer to play, put a record on when friends came to visit. And one very austere scholar um, said, don't you have anything less, um, you know, less syrupy? <laughs> <laughs> but still, they had music in the home and she, bless her cotton socks, took me to concerts, took my, me and my brothers to concerts on Sunday afternoons and then bought us the season tickets that enabled us to go every Saturday night. And Glasgow so, was a very musical town in those days. Well, it had a great concert hall and it had an orchestra. The concert hall burnt down some years later when some people at a boxing match left something under the sea that they shouldn't have done. But it, before that, it was called St Andrew's Halls and it was one of the old cigar box shaped um, concert halls that the great Victorian cities had. And Glasgow, of course, was one of the great Victorian cities of Europe, the second city of the empire, perhaps. Dublin would have claimed that, perhaps, probably. And it had, and we had an orchestra, and the orchestra was pretty good. It was agony to wait for the entry of the horns if you knew it was coming. And I once remember a performance of Brahms' Second Piano Concerto by Claudio Arrau, because the great stars, I mean, 20 great pianists a year came to Glasgow. But in Brahms too, he had to play, you know, with the solo cello, and there was a great deal of horn, and I, I was in agony for, on his behalf as the cello scraped. But he was very gallant about it. In the end of the performance, he went up and showed sh sh the cellist's hand. Uh, but the funny the thing that, that, uh, that happened is that I, because at an age which I couldn't identify, I came to the conclusion that, yes, there was football and cricket, and yes, there would be girls, but actually what I should do with my life was see as many paintings, listen to as many symphonies, read as many books as possible. And actually the thing I did before any music and anything else was read, 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 read. But I just couldn't get enough of it, and I thought the day is wasted unless I've done a lot of that, and that my time is wasted if I'm not doing one of those things. We've got to face the question of whether there are any young people now who feel like that. 
Well, what I, what I realise about uh, me is, you see, that all the things that young people who are now older people, you know, and are harking back to their youth of pop and rock, uh, what, what they're talking about is an experience that escaped me completely because, uh, I mean, I, yes, I liked some pop music very much, but the pop music I heard, there was a wonderful radio program, which I used to hear on Saturday afternoons at 6.30, uh, which was called Jack... Well, there must have been two programs. One began with Joe Loss and his band live playing In the Mood. Now, that's got to get, you know, da 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 that. And then there was a guy called Jack Jackson and his record Roundup. And what he... He was a real original... And there's nobody is that I'm aware of like him on the radio today. But the records that he picked were from a wide-ranging, eclectic uh, choice of, um, of folk and uh, uh, Pee Wee Hunt and Phil Harris and all sorts of people. Those I love. But the moment it began to get homogenized, I just ignored it. So you're saying you're listening, you're listening to good pop? I thought I was listening to good pop and I didn't need bad pop. What about the Edinburgh Festival? You couldn't get there by bus from Glasgow. We went by train. We went from Queen Street Station. It cost five shillings for a cheap day return. We had packed lunches, three of us. We used to. The, the festival program would come out in February, March, and we or we wrote away. We went through it, and we wrote away for tickets. And what we were looking for, in order to get the best possible value out of the five shilling day return were days on which we could enjoyably go to three performances before we came home. So we'd get there in time for chamber music in the Freemasons Hall on George Street at 11. You could get there, of course, in 45 minutes, 50 minutes. We've got a 9.30 train, bags of time for the 11 o'clock uh, chamber music. Then there would be something in the afternoon, which might be at the Usher Hall or might be at the Lyceum Theatre. I heard The Winter's Tale. I I say heard, although I actually saw the Winter's Tale, because f I was sitting in a, in a, at the end of a row in the upper circle, and I heard a voice underneath me, and that was John Gilgood, and that was the first time I heard Gilgood. So I heard him before I saw him. And then in the evening, uh, it was either the big stuff at the Usher Hall, Bruno Walter with the New York Philharmonic, Ermgard Seyfried wearing a wonderful day collotage with fantastic sunburn girls. and something to show off with singing her girls. sunburn, singing girls. And, uh, or it was the opera in the King's Theatre, which was absolutely tiny, quite hopeless from the point of view of major productions, but nevertheless... It sometimes helps, doesn't it? It helps. Yeah. I mean, it was so close that it wasn't till years and years and years later when I got to go to Glyndebourne, because it was Glyndebourne I principally heard in Edinburgh, that opera spoke to me intimately like that music did. That was joy. And we danced. We ran and danced at the same time down the hill to the Haymarket station from the, uh, from the King's Theatre to catch the train back to Glasgow. So uh, the opera was the thing once you started seeing it? I think so. I mean, uh, yes, it was. And we heard marvellous recitals and marvellous symphony concerts. One, I saw Foot Wengler do the Beethoven 3 and 4 and other things. And Marv, I heard Kathleen Ferrier sing Das Lied von der Erde under Bruno Walter. And a French woman in the Usher Hall behind me said, you know, formidable. <laughs> And that got to me. But, I, but certainly, what, the love of opera that I have started in Edinburgh. And it hurts a Glaswegian to say that, because I would like to say that it started in Glasgow, but you're, I think I can't. You're one of those undergraduates who goes up to Oxford, already knowing everything you need to know when you come down. So what did you actually do? Oh, then? no, on the contrary. I mean, I, I went to Oxford, and it was like the biggest box of toys, the biggest... The, the the most lavish f f table spread with a feast that that you can imagine because Glasgow uh, was not I mean Edinburgh you know claimed to be the Athens of North Kent and said it was the Trondheim of the South West <laughs> uh, Glasgow cared and Glasgow was a great city but it was limited and society was limited and and so on but here I was in Oxford where there were poetry societies and film societies and theatre clubs wonderful lectures by great teachers. I heard Isaac Berlin, 
Um, and there was politics and debating and so on. So there was the day was absolutely crowded, and uh, I think that would have been unimaginable in if I had gone where everybody else I knew went to Glasgow University, because a university in the middle of a city, uh, where, which is not a residential university, where everybody lives at different corners of the perimeter of the city, uh, and has to get back there somehow in the evening is not the same thing as somewhere where you can stay up all night um, chatting away with everybody you know you know and love. Today, someone with your tastes, loves, indeed passions, and most of them very learned, would probably be warned off television, and I think at last lately with some reason. But for a long, long time that wasn't true. The, the television built a great beneficial system of giving arts to the people and it was starting to do that in a big way when you went into it. Did you see that coming? Do you wanted to, wanted to contribute to it? Did you see that as part of a mission? Well, my, the mission that took me in, which I saw um, happening and made me ring up and say, please, was a mission that a man called Sidney Bernstein had, who was the owner and boss of Granada. I remember him well. He, he wanted me to cut my beard off. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he was right. He was a very strange man, though. I mean, he wanted to know, you know, what shoes you were wearing and that kind of thing. And when I auditioned Michael Heseltine for him to present a kind of Vesper program, he made him get up out of his seat and walk around the studio so he could see how he walked. But Sidney had a belief that the public was entitled to know what was going on in the society which they as citizens uh, ought to control. And so he wanted to use television to educate them in that. He's a very cultivated man. Right? Yes, yes. He, and he bought paintings and showed, uh, hung the studios with paintings. Um, uh, just jumping um, forward a bit, I'm bound to say I thought, I came in on the tail end of this, and I'm bound to say I thought it was always going to be like this, that the great and good would be in charge of TV and it would be it would fulfill its divine mission. But do you think, Clive, that we were entitled to believe that that was the way it should be? I mean, I would say, you see, that there was, I, I would now concede that although I wouldn't diminish by whit my love of and, uh, and admiration for the great minds or pens that I encountered or the great musicians, I don't know, I, there was a snobbishness in that attitude which consisted of saying that there wasn't really anything else that was worth bothering about. The popular culture just didn't matter very much. And it wasn't until Hoggart came along uh, and wrote Literary that Hoggart, book, yeah, The Uses yeah, of Literacy, yeah. and, you know, that one began to see that the high, the culture that I thought was culture was actually just a culture however admirable, desirable, still refreshing and sustaining, among several, and that others were going to want to look in one day. And I think that what television was doing in those days was, although it was in the hands, to an extent, of mandarins, it was, it was it, what ITV forced the BBC to do was to realise that if they wanted to reach everybody in the, in the society, they had to provide the entertainment that everybody would enjoy. And, and I was there um, when uh, ITV launched its onslaught on the BBC, and the BBC brilliantly, under Hugh Green, the greatest um, broadcasting executive of the second half of the century, pretty well of the century, um, be, he uh, unleashed the BBC in response by tapping in a way that ITV was not really capable of doing, the creative talents of writers, comedians, you know, and he, that was the work that one remembers and was knocked over by. The Wednesday play, Z cars, the, you know, the comedies of well, Goldman you, Simpson and so on and so forth. You yourself had a pretty wide range as you moved up the production level. At Thames, you were, some of the programs that you when we, we look back on it, it wasn't rock follies and things like that were happening under your... Yes, your, because you. I had the good fortune. I mean, I, when I, I... You know, first of all, ITV was told, you may have 70% of the audience, the BBC would hit back and make it 55, 45, 55, uh, 55 to ITV. They were told by the regulators, you guys are making absolute fortunes. You're printing money. You've got 55% of the audience. Now, for heaven's sake, use the position that you have 
to extend the range of possibilities that you're offering viewers. And they began, first of all, by doing it with one-offs that were complete and utter exceptions to the general run of the station. You know, I mean, um, uh, Rediffusion boasted of a drama in Greek called Icon Vesiklis or something, you know, which was directed by a lovely woman, a very able woman called Joan Kemp Welsh. But it was a complete and total one-off. Or they would do uh, Frankie Howard as bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream or something. But they were told, no, 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 that's not enough. We need one quiz game less and one and more good, serious drama. And I was actually asked, when I became director, so there was, a, so there was then an ambition that on ITV's part that it's news, which was uh, always a bit of a pioneer but never had much space, that it's current affairs, was only one or maybe two half hours a week, uh, that they should be at least as good as anything the BBC could do, and if possible, better. And it was because of what I did in Rediffusion's Current Affairs programme this week that I was asked to go to the BBC and do Panorama, which I uh, didn't get right, and so on. It seems to me that there was a fruitful contest between BBC and ITV, which could have gone on forever, but the rules were changed radically under the Thatcher government when the, the quality requirements were removed from the Correct. ITV franchise. Yeah, that's right. Now, the minute... At the moment, the ITV didn't have to do something right. high quality Absolutely. to get the franchise. You it didn't it. do it. You got it. And down it went, and the BBC chased it, yeah. which means you didn't have to do it. I, I was asked by the chairman of the company, Thames, to spend more money on programmes. We're, we're making so much money, we're doing pretty well, but we've got to make it more evident that we're spending more money on programmes. Thence, Edward and Mrs. Simpson, Rock Follies, Howard Schumann's Rock Follies, Trevor Griffith's Bill Brand, you know... Uh, um, um, Philip Mackey's The Naked Civil Servant. I had the great good fortune when I was made uh, director of programs at Thames in something like, in 74, I think, to be, that Thames had just been told by ITV, by the ITEA, whatever it's called, the regulatory body, you guys have done an absolutely terrific job and it's too good. You're too successful. Please take more risks. And I got to be director of programs. I hired Verity Lambert to run the drama, and she, her nose and her judgment, gave us Rock Follies and right. Bill Brand. And, I think and the Naked of Civil Servant remains to this day the single most original and amazing television program. It's the I best ever saw. script, Clive, I've ever read, you know, because it was a script that couldn't be done on the say so of the head of drama, and indeed it couldn't even be done on my say so. I had to say to the managing director, you know, we're going to do this, and uh, you guys are going to be proud of it. But it was Philip Mackey's script, which had been hawked round the television companies and hawked up and down Warder Street, and nobody would do it, was the single most perfectly version of a thing that I've seen. And Jack Gold uh, got it absolutely dead right. It's a stunning director. It gives me an excuse to jump straight through to Channel 4. Uh, and John Hurt, <laughs> at the party in my house to celebrate its winning the Pre Italia, felt my bottom. <laughs> It's <laughs> inspired by the film, no doubt. Yeah. The, uh, it gives me a, a, a cue to jump straight through to Channel 4 because that kind of originality was what Channel 4 was meant to be to do, wasn't it? Yes. Something that no, 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 nobody else was doing. Something that nobody else was doing, yet I knew with a part of me that, that was heard by me that without a certain level of audience, you know, we would die. Also I knew that if you ask people who think they who work in television or who think they want to work in television that what you want is uh, something that nobody else is doing, you, you'd be you won't be surprised for me to tell you that what you get is actually you know, not very surprising. I mean I made a speech to the independent producers and said don't, I don't want ideas that have gathered dust on the shelf. You know, don't think you can just dust the dust off and shove it at me. I don't want that. I want something absolutely new. Of thousands of ideas, and I mean pretty well, or certainly hundreds of ideas, of, of, that is to say of specific program proposals that we received, less than half a dozen seem to me original in the sense that you intend. And that you're right, the channel was there to do, and some of the originality of those was sat on by people in a position to sit on them, you know, as they got underway.
Well, you, you build it and you, you hit your audience figure, and you, when you left, you told Michael Gray that if he screwed it up, you'd kill him. Yes. But Michael Gray did not say this to Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and the last time I looked at Channel 4, I think it was about midnight on a Thursday night, I thought I, it was a bad night in the Weimar Republic. I, I, I thought, I don't really need to know that much about sex. I already know. I know or if I don't know, I don't, I don't know that much. I don't want to know that. Quite. Well, they can't stop. Well, they, can't, they just don't know how to stop. They're not any longer doing quite the sort of Friday night, late night sleaze that accumulated there for an hour and a half or two hours in many oh. weeks in Michael Gray's ITV. time. But the ITV is doing it now. Channel they're 4 doing doesn't it, so have to. Don't have to. I but think I mean, if when ITV I was, does club reps, then Channel 4's got nowhere to go. Uh-huh, uh well, I couldn't. You I, haven't see, seen I wouldn't watch I can tell you haven't seen club reps. No, no, of course I haven't. I've got better <laughs> things to do. But I, I took part the other day in a discussion on censorship at the British Library, apropos of a great world encyclopedia of censorship that's just coming out. And... Um, I was remembering, and I actually do think that in measurable ways, the tolerance, I mean, or the range that is publishable on telly has altered dramatically. I make no value judgment about this, not necessarily altogether for anybody's good, um, in a couple of ways that are ev particularly evident at this time. One of them, of course, is sex. I mean, at, Reed, if you, at Thames, I had a series, which I never got on the air, called Sex in Our, T in Our Time. It was as straightforward and simple uh, as, as could be, obviously, the episode, which I regretted, uh, uh, shot in Soho about the sex industry was sleazy and tits and bums, and it couldn't really be anything else. And I'd said to the guys, what on earth did you make my task difficult for by doing one out of six there? But they had done. But the thing that really got the regulators, the censors, goat, was uh, women sitting around talking about their bodies and looking at a diagram of a vagina. And that sequence got the series banned. Sorry, we can't, we won't do it. You can, we won't allow it. Don't do it. But the other night, Granada, uh, they had a, a program on called Designer Vagina. Yes, they did you know, indeed. Which again, you probably watched, Clive. No, sure I, didn't I didn't watch it. But I didn't watch it. I had, but anyway, I, the other thing is Northern Ireland. The great example of what could not be broadcast in Britain for 30 odd years uh, was Northern Ireland. Uh, because there was but you, a, did a, you did a series about it at one stage. Historic well, series. I did a history, uh, it's a, uh, a history of Ireland, but I'm talking about the current affairs attempt to report yeah. there. Nobody reported the situation in Northern Ireland for decades. BBC Northern Ireland was a Stalinist fiefdom within a Stalinist central system, and they had a veto on any BBC coverage of Northern Ireland. Uh, so that you couldn't do it unless the controller of Northern Ireland approved. ITV was a bit looser, but when we sent guys over there to report the Protestant ascendancy and why, this is before 68, you know, before the, the, the more recent ruckuses and troubles started. I mean, Ulster Television either tried to stop us in the person of an extraordinary figure, the managing director, Brum Henderson, who was a very big man, and picked up a very big reporter, whom you probably know, called Godfrey Hodgson, mm. and nearly threw him against the wall in the boardroom of Ulster Television because he said, what the hell are you doing here? Why don't you leave us to, uh, you know, uh, report on our own affairs? We have no right to be here. And, uh, and when, when Bloody Sunday happened, and I was in charge of current affairs at Thames, the chairman of Thames tried to stop us on the following Thursday for this week reporting anything about it. I mean, he was a lawyer, and he argued, um, you know, it's going to be sub judice. I don't trust you guys to get it right, so just, you know, stay out of it. And uh, although I had the best reporter on Ireland in uh, British television, he was hamstrung in what he had to do that, that week. But today, you've at last got, uh, uh, by a sort of will of the broadcaster, to report what's going on there, or what did go on there. You, uh, you obviously, you were all the time, you had your own channel, there was only really one big position to go to, and then you were offered Covent Garden, and correct me if I'm wrong, but... You were actually offered the job, and then suddenly the possibility that you might be Director General of the BBC opened. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. I mean, I was offered the job. To clinch the job, I had to go and have a drink with the chairman, John Sainsbury. He wanted to be absolutely this certain. This is a Covent Garden. Yeah. Uh, Covent Garden that he could work with me. 
on the afternoon before, two in the afternoon when I was due to see him at six, uh, somebody stuck their head round the door and said Alistair Milne has been fired and there's a vacancy at the BBC. And I didn't pay any attention because I was going to see him and to talk about the Opera House. But, um, but that was a, maybe a Thursday. By Before the weekend, the phone was ringing and the papers were running the odds on the candidates and people were saying to me, come on, Jeremy. If you, I'd known your phone number, I would have been ringing to say, for God's sake, you go for it. it. Uh, yeah. to go in. But I wouldn't necessarily have been a very good director general of the BBC Club because it's a gigantic job and you need all sorts of strengths and insights, managerial well, insights, for example, that I, you know, may not yeah, necessarily possess. Let's say that a love of programs uh, and, a, and yeah. a real desire to do remarkable things helps. I would have had that on my banner, that's right. And I would have worked with, I told the, I told the Board of Governors at the interview that I would work with uh, Michael Checkland, who, uh, because he you know, could do the sums and... Uh, but, of course, he got the director generalship because they weren't going to have me, as was evident during the interview. And um, where a Scots trade unionist, John Boyd, who was the, had been the, the general secretary and was now the president of the Amalgamated Engineering Workers, he said to me, Mr Isaacs, he was a Salvation Army man, by the way, he said, Mr Isaacs, he said, some of us here have the impression that you don't take very kindly to discipline. <laughs> now, I see by the smile on your face that you take that as a compliment, but I can assure you that I and others here see it as a criticism. <laughs> <laughs> and that was <laughs> and it. I was dead, yes. And that was it. it was Andy, yeah, but you, weren't, you went to Covent Garden. That's another story. We should do another program about that. For now, I have to say thank you very much. What an absolute pleasure to be with you. <laughs>